Welcome, everybody, to a very special edition of, well, the stories we do here. Today, we will be starting a series of stories. There are six of them in total, each chapter presenting something even more disturbing than the last. And this series is called The Asylum. If any of you have heard this story before, then you already know what you're in for. But if you don't, simply look up the author. A man by the name of Matt Demersky. An author credited for such stories as Psychosis. Not our first mistake. And a trick of perspective. So, without further ado, Sit back, relax, and make sure that you're alone <laughs> as we delve into chapter one, Eating Disorder. In the interests of anonymity, I will say only that I work in healthcare. We seem to get more than our fair share of strange patients. But one in... One in particular has been on my mind lately. The girl in question, a recent admission, had a story disturbing enough to run through the interdepartment grapevine fairly often. Tired of hearing the same gossip repeated endlessly, I pulled and read her file, intending to debunk the rumors. I wish I hadn't. The following is a cleaned-up version of her personal written account. This is all a misunderstanding, honestly. I'm fine. I am not the problem. There's someone out there, someone else, responsible for this. They are doing this to me, to torture me. I shouldn't even be here. I've had issues with body image. That much is true. I was actually failing yet another diet when it first happened. We were out celebrating Becky's promotion. The five of us were at dinner. It was a really nice restaurant, but I can't remember which. And my diet willpower was running on empty. We'd all had a glass or two of wine by the time my salad came. I had resolved to eat only half of it, and only that much so as not to cause a scene on Becky's night. The girls pestered me whenever I refused to eat. Still, I couldn't help but think that it was no coincidence that the skinniest out of the five of us was the first to get promoted. We'd all graduated more than a year ago, and the real world was like a slap in the face. None of us were really where we wanted to be, except Becky, of course. Hunger filled me with constant pain, and hating myself for it stressed me to the limit. So when the waiter put cheese on my salad, I didn't stop him. No, I wanted to throw the salad away to refuse to eat, but I was so hungry. And then, two bites in, angry but putting on a happy face for the girls, I found a long black hair wrapping around pieces of lettuce. It immediately disgusted me. I'd almost eaten it without realizing. We got our meals for free, and the girls didn't even bother me when I couldn't bring myself to eat. The hair had knocked out my hunger completely, and I was on cloud nine for the next day or two. I wasn't hungry. I wasn't stressed. It was amazing. I thought I'd stumbled onto some new, great form of self-control, but the girls thought otherwise. Or maybe, maybe just Becky. I was at lunch with Andrea when the hunger began to reach a breaking point again. Depleted and sad, I gave in and ordered a large salad. Andrea smiled and said something about being there for me if I needed to talk. I bet she was in on it. In my memories, her smile seems vaguely sinister and mocking, as if she anticipated what would happen. I found a fingernail in my salad. A fake red fingernail! Those things are disgusting. There are so many germs under fake nails, I know. Lunch was free again, but I couldn't bring myself to eat. The shock and disgust had again knocked out my hunger completely. 
Part of me was relieved and empowered. I was going on two weeks without eating, and this whole disgust thing was really helping me lose weight. But I'm not crazy. I am, I am not crazy or stupid. I know that you have to eat sometimes. Another day or two passed, and I ordered a chicken salad while I brunch with Becky. She kept gloating on and on about her new job, about how her boss was vaguely hitting on her. I hated her. I hated her so, so much. Secretly, even if outwardly, I was happy for her. I was mainly focused on my salad, though. It was sweet relief, finally eating. Until I bit down on something hard and squishy. I spit it out quickly, and I remember Becky's words. Oh my god, is that a toe? I remember staring at the thing as it sat on my napkin. It was mushed, ground up red, and cooked a little. But a bone, a white, pearly bone, clearly stuck out of it. The entire place shut down temporarily after that, but nobody could figure out where the toe had come from. Obviously, none of the employees were missing it, but Becky passed in the attention from the ordeal. She even got on local television, even though it was my salad that had the toe in it. This is a travesty. People can get seriously sick if they accidentally eat things like that, she'd said to the reporter. I was starting to wonder whether she had something to do with it. The shock overwhelmed me, dispelling my hunger for a little under a day, but my relief and enjoyment was short-lived. I knew I'd have to start eating again, sooner rather than later. Not up for any more of Becky's sick pranks, I decided to scope the vending machines at the mall. I hated myself so much right about then, staring at candy bars and feeling weak. But, but I had to eat, and I had no willpower left. Chocolate. Chocolate would make things better. I bit into that thing. So amazing, sweet, sweet chocolate. It was only two bites in that I saw something poking out between the wrapper and the candy bar, halfway down. Pulling the wrapper back, I couldn't help but hurl it on the floor as I puked up what I'd eaten. As pressed between the wrapper and chocolate was what was unmistakably a flap of skin. Had it been sliced off of somebody, traces of blood to God! But how? How the hell had Becky done it? How had she known? I was full on terrified and angry then, even if a tiny part of me had been relieved to throw out the two bites that I'd eaten. Tortured, but still fighting my own urge to not eat, I ordered a slice of pizza at the food court. It came with a large bubble in the crust, sickly, despairing. I ripped it open, finding what looked like someone's cornea cooked inside. She had to be somewhere around, tracking me, doing this to me. Did she have the help of all the girls in town? I drove, and by nightfall I ended up across the state line. I pulled into a backwater restaurant I'd never even heard of. Relieved, I ordered a hamburger from the polite old man who probably owned the place. There was no way Becky or the girls could interfere with my food here. The hamburger slid in front of me on a quaintly decorated plate looked like the most delicious thing ever. I still considered not eating, still considered continuing my diet, and I hated myself for giving in, but I didn't want to die. People have to eat. But I paused before biting in. Sliding back the bun, I investigated the contents, and everything seemed normal until... until I lifted up the tomato from the lettuce. Now, I couldn't tell what it was at first. A pinkish-grayish blob? A bump in the ketchup. I lifted it up by a stringy bit and stared at it until... I... 
I finally understood. It was the piece of brain matter. I would have thrown up, but my heaving stomach had nothing in it. I drove away from there as fast as I could, continuing in random directions. I don't know how Becky and the girls were tracking me or predicting what I would eat, but I had to evade them. Candy bar from a gas station? Nope. Chicken nuggets from a drive-thru? No. I still don't understand how they did it. I even begged a younger kid to make me a sub from start to finish, watching the entire process, making sure nothing was in it. He handed it to me, I opened it up, and, oh God, I still remember his expression of sheer confusion and horror as I screamed. But a strange calm came after that. Three weeks without eating. Four? I knew, I knew I would die if I did not eat soon. I had, I had this strange thought <laughs> of a place they couldn't predict, couldn't make disgusting and inedible. I found it, I did. I beat them. I found the most delectable salad. And I ate it desperately, gorging, knowing that I was finally saved. But I'll be honest, that wasn't what I expected to find the first time I did it. But of course, it makes sense now. When I cracked his skull open with that pipe, I almost couldn't believe it. He fell, and chicken salad splattered across the pavement. Supple green lettuce, crunchy and stringy strips of chewy chicken, and that dressing. Oh, that dressing was to die for. I was finding pieces of people in my food no matter where I went. So the only logical place to find something edible was inside of people. We have to feed her intravenously. Normal food terrifies and disgusts her. The whole thing makes me wonder how, in this day and age, we can still be so tortured by our own most basic desires. Though she's not the strangest patient we have here, she interests me because of her ability to manipulate the nurses. Apparently. And nobody ever did figure out who helped her. She convinced somebody to sneak body parts into her food the first few times. We tried to feed her. At least... That's the only explanation of those incidents that makes any sense. <laughs> Chapter 2 the Bone Walker. After delving further into patients' counts, I've become more aware of the bizarre array of afflictions that we contain here. I'll be honest, I never really thought of the patients as people before. Crazy is a label that immediately dehumanizes someone, cutting them off from any sympathy or understanding. There's one girl, for instance, who refuses to talk to anyone unless she's allowed to feel their temples for nerve fibers first, whatever that means. Other than that, and some mild paranoia, she seems completely aware and normal. But before, it was easy to write her off as just another crazy patient. I wonder what she's thinking. She refused to give any explanation for her behavior. 
The more I read their accounts, the more I realize that these are real people afflicted by tortures beyond mundane imagination. Last night, reading while on break, one man's words caught my attention. I know him. He's consistently depressed, resigned, and drained. But now I think that, underneath all that, he may be like any of us. He's just pained by this thing that grips him. Fine, I'll tell you. Just no more shocks. You, you promised no more shocks if I tell you. It doesn't make a difference anyway. I know how it started. It's obvious now when I think back. I was on the street, walking with friends. We were drinking and heading to the next bar, when some weird, disgusting guy with desperate eyes bumped into me. He smelled like sweat and something else, but he spilled something on me. It got on my hand, on my fingernails, specifically. It was blood. He'd spilled blood on me. He froze, seemed horrified and sad. I'm sorry, he said. I believed him, but I didn't know what he was sorry for. He ran. Disgusted, I cleaned it off and tried to forget about it. And nothing happened. For a while. Oh, God. I remember every detail of that night, lying by myself in my crappy little apartment. Oh, how I miss it. A palace compared to your... care. I woke up just before it happened. I gazed at my dark ceiling, feeling strange, and then I was curled up in pain, too shocked even to scream. I remember staring at it, not, not yet understanding how screwed I was. This long, bloody blade thing was sticking out from my skin. Where did it come from? Did someone stab me? I didn't understand. I, I reached for the phone, but seized with pain again as the blade moved. Another long, white, razor-like thing shot out, and the two separated, slicing an open line in my shin. I had sudden visions of the razors continuing, slicing me into sections from the inside out. Now I almost wish it had. I didn't have much time to panic. The slicing stopped. I stared, clutching my leg. Four more bloody protrusions joined the first two, and then... It's... it slid out. Shaking, numb from shock and panic, I felt a small relief that I wasn't about to be carved up, and then... That consolation vanished as I realized something living had just crawled out of my shin bone. Dripping with my blood, it scanned the room with six pearly eyes, seemingly carved from, seemingly carved from bone. It stood on six razor-like legs, the blades that had eviscerated my skin. About two feet high, it was much like a spider. Unexpected, it said. It had no mouth! How did it speak? Uh, unexpected, I asked, numb and terrified. Who are you? Trembling and on the verge of tears, I just wanted it to go away. Nobody important. That was the wrong answer. It jabbed a leg back into my exposed shin bone, neatly avoiding the separated flesh and streaming blood. I felt a sharp jab in my chest. I understood implicitly. 
horrified that this creature's razor leg injured my tibia but emerged from one of my ribs. A bladed point pressed against my heart from the inside. Please, please, I begged, sweat running into my eyes. I'll do anything you say. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Just don't kill me. Acceptable. It replied. It withdrew its leg, and the pain in my chest went with it. You will do as instructed, or die in utmost pain. Yes, yes, that's fine, I choked out, sobbing. It climbed back into my exposed bone, and then it was gone. Haven't given me no instructions. I went to the hospital, got my legs sewn up, claimed it was an accident, and it seemed I had my life back. But, but I was wrong. It slid out between my stitches a few nights later. Dismayed but ready, I made sure to memorize everything I could about it. Spindly, deadly. It was strangely beautiful, in an ivory and insect sort of way. Somebody had to know about this thing. It gave me orders. It made me do things. It started with small crimes. It wanted them done in a specific manner, with contrived evidence left behind for reasons that I wasn't told. It directed me to dangerous criminal locales, though other people were the least of my concerns by then. One of its other slaves gave me a long animal bone treated with that special blood, and it often made me bring this bone to shady locations. It would emerge from that bone and converse with someone. Someone aware of it, able to defend from it? Someone it needed to make a deal with for its purposes? I, I never saw him. I doubted he would help me even if I found him, though. I gave up hope after many failed nights of searching for an answer or help. I'd beaten people, mugged them, held up a convenience store at knife point. It even made me get that cursed blood on this guy's fingernails, and I had to watch as he slowly separated into sections by protruding razor legs. His hand falling to the floor, his leg popping off at the knee by a rotating slice, screaming, begging, pleading. It tortured him to death for information that I, I just didn't understand, and it made me pick up his pieces and dispose of them. God. Whenever I wasn't on assignment, I, I turned to other ways to distract myself from the black pit of despair welling up inside me. My brother found me on the street after a few months of this. I remember every detail of that, too. You have to come home, he insisted. We'll get you off the drugs, clean you up. Dad'll get you a job. The drugs aren't the problem, I remember shouting at him. They're the only thing that keep me from losing my mind! It's the Bone Locker! As I said those words, a sharp jab hit me underneath my left shoulder blade. The next scratch the side of my right lung, I realized it was watching me. The message was clear. If I told anyone, it would carve me up from the inside out. Get out of here! I screamed at him, feeling every bit the same now as that disgusting and desperate man who had bumped into me. You can't help me! Go away! I hit the hard drugs even harder then. At some point, I was drained of everything, even resembling my old self, and I decided not to do it anymore. Even if it meant my death. At its behest, I bought a rifle and trained in its use. It wanted me to kill somebody, somebody important, but when it came with the name and plan, I would refuse. 
I wondered how it would do it. How it would stab inward from my skull, killing me instantly? Or would it slice me from each of my bones, carving me up slowly like that poor, poor man? I stared at the gun, wondering if it would go after my family if I refused. Did I really have a choice? Could I sacrifice my brother too and my parents? I had to make the bone walker think it wasn't my fault. I called and left an anonymous tip. I sat there filled with relief and calm as they surrounded me and put me in the handcuffs. I sat in custody, ostensibly caught by the police when the bone walker came. It would have no reason to punish my family. It would just kill me. And that was that. But it never came. I mean, I, I know why it didn't return now, but I'm broken and stuck here in any case. And I keep thinking, what if there are more? What if they come for me someday? Because I know there will be no warning. It could come at any time. Just a sharp, sliding sensation. And then... And then I will finally... Be free. The thing that captivates me about his account is that it's very similar to some ravings left by a man who died horribly a while back. He was mutilated in ways unimaginable to the human mind, as if his face had been torn off from the inside, among other very, very curious things. His story made the news, and they figured he was the serial killer responsible for several similar horrific deaths. But that man claimed that, as his last act, he'd managed to destroy the creature. I suppose this man must have read about the prior man's issues and formed an obsession or delusion about it. I find it curious how contagious crazy seems to be, and seemingly more so these days. I'm starting to wonder if this place is truly run to help these people? Or rather, it's really just here to contain them. Almost like quarantine for a plague.